All right, here we go. Today, we are honored to welcome Gene Deal. Uh, Gene did extensive security work for Bad Boy Records and was on the scene as Puffy's personal bodyguard the tragic night that Biggie was murdered. And in fact, was the one who actually pursued the car that shot Biggie and pulled Biggie out of the car after the shooting. Welcome to Vlad TV. Oh, it's good to be here, Vlad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm glad uh, to be here, brother. Long time coming. We've been talking about doing this for a while, so I'm glad we finally managed to make it happen. Well, you know, um, MREC uh, got in touch with me because, you know, he the one got me started in this whole YouTube thing. You know, it was kind of against my, uh, what I usually do. And um, he told me that you wanted to get in touch with me way back when. And I told him that Chaz told me not to do it until, uh, I had a book or something that was ready to come on your program because it would be a great thing to promote it. And then you know, it went back and forth. You got these internet clowns that come up and and uh, they was posting stuff. Vlad said it is not, it don't make sense for Gene Deal to come on his show and everything like that. And I was like, these half a homo cats out here just doing crazy stuff, you know, just to get attention. But I've always said when... Uh, two men talk and meet each other as men, you know, some resolutions have come by. There you go. And uh, rest in peace to Chaz. I got a chance to interview him before he passed. Uh, yeah. Very stand-up dude. I've always respected him a lot. And no doubt. My condolences to people like you who are, who are close to him. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. So, so let's go ahead and start at the beginning. So you were actually born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. And, uh, uh, I was raised and I grew up on Vanderbilt and North Market till I got 12 years old. And then uh, my grandfather was dying. I found out and realized my grandfather, my the grandfather who I thought was my father was my grandfather. And then I met my mother and then uh, she lived out in Wellston. And when he passed, I moved out of Wellston until I graduated from high school and went on to college. And you were actually doing some security work in high school. Oh, yeah, we had um, Future Shock Music Productions and Dynamite Disco. There were two DJ groups out there. And um, I did the security along with DJ, was trying to DJ at the time. <laughs> okay. And I guess you had a girlfriend that was coming out to New York, which you followed, and you ended up basically Right. I met York. her at school and uh, ended up following her to New York. And then I met Jackie Knowles. Jackie Knowles, he was a great basketball player here. He went to Niagara Falls, University of Niagara, I think Niagara Falls. And uh, I think they were, uh, they had made it to NCAA or NIAA, something like that. He was a great guard. He was trying to get me overseas to play ball. But um, I decided to rip my knee up and I decided not to. Okay, so you get settled in New York. And you start to hang around Harlem. And you're a part of the original guys that formed a, a crew called The Same Gang. Right. Um, I was playing basketball, and I met this guy named Slick. And he was playing against this dude named Alpo on the east side. And uh, I started playing basketball for him. And uh, I didn't know they were paying guys at the time, you know what I'm saying, for play basketball. So he would ask me after the game, after we won or something like that, yo, what, what you want? And I was like, I just need orange juice. And they was giving guys 500, 1500, you know, for playing in the games. I would have, and I was always one of the guys that had like the most rebounds or, you know what I'm saying, or, or did real good in, you know, scoring stuff because I had a little scoring game too. But I didn't know that they were paying guys at the time. So uh, I started playing ball at different places. Uh, then I got with the Courtsmans. Then I got with the uh, the ball team. Then I was became a um, counselor at St. John's Cathedral, and I met a guy named D. Ferg. D. Ferg, uh, that's Aesop Ferg's father. And um, I was playing ball there. Then I started playing with the same gang. Well, it wasn't the same gang at the time. I just started playing ball with D. Ferg, and then he, you know, we started the same game. Okay, and, and D. Ferg actually worked with, you know, 
the music companies, I guess he actually designed the artwork for Uptown Records, like the actual cat. Yes, he did. Uh, for Uptown Records. Then later on, he went on to design the Bad Boy logo. Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Dope. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then at one point, Puffy actually became part of Same Gang with you guys. Yes, he did. Uh, we were outside on 144th and 8th Avenue, and Puff used to always come and try to go to the parties with us. At that time, we was going to Tim Dog and uh, Corey, I think, uh, I don't know Corey last name, Corey Jacobs or something like that. He was, uh, uh, they had the butt naked crew. We was going to their parties. We was going to Peter Shoe party. We were going to uh, Black and Gold, Sparkles Entertainment, uh, the the skating rink, the just everything that was happening. Uh, Willie Burgers at night, and then we were also going to the Apollo Theater. So he wanted to hang with us. He wanted to hang with us because he was an intern for Uptown. And he wanted to, you know, get to know people from Harlem. So because D. Ferg did that uh, logo for Uptown Records and we knew Tim, we knew Heavy D and everybody like that, he started wanting to hang with us. So then uh, he just was there too much. And then somebody said, yo, man, we're just going to jump him in. You know what I'm saying? So if he got out of his car this day, this particular day, he got out of the car, he was driving those uh those Volkswagen Cabaretos uh, with the... Uh, cabriolet. Cabriolet. All right. The Volkswagen Cabriolet with the uh, the sunroof on it. They say, once we get around to grab him, and then we just going to torture his ass. So, you know, like, when that torture was like, we was right there next to the store. It was outside. We will get a bunch of little Debbie cakes and everything, smash them in the head, sprinkle them with champagne and everything like that, and make them saying gang and everything like that. So... When Puff came out the car, the little cats grabbed him. But Puff wiggled away from him, and they didn't catch him until we was on 144th Street. They didn't catch him until uh, he got to 127th Street. So that's like, <laughs> that was like close to 20-something blocks. So they caught him, brought him back. You know what I'm saying? They roughed him up a little bit and say, now nah, you same game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, okay. And Puffy... I mean, not only was he an intern at Uptown, but he started doing his own parties and he was really successful at the parties. Yeah, he was doing, and, he, he was actually doing Upside Hype. You, did you know un, Unsigned Hype on Monday nights? Yeah. That was right. when um, uh, Leaders of the New School where Buster Ryan was in and different groups, you know, they would come there on Monday night and perform. And then on Wednesday night, he had the Red Zone doing parties, what he called Daddy's House. Mm-hmm. Right, and you were doing security for these parties. Yeah, I did. Okay, so, and that's how you kind of got with Puff in terms of the working relationship. Well, yeah, basically. You know what I'm saying? Okay. He, uh, he needed somebody that was strong, that was that was going to, you know, look out for his best interest, and because he was same gang at the time, I was doing that. Well, then in 1991, there was the Heavy D and Puff Daddy celebrity basketball game. City College tragedy. Right. You were doing security that night. Yes, I that was. That day, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, from what I understand, and I've talked to a few people about this and, and read articles about it, that the event itself was oversold. There was all these kids who bought $20 tickets, and some of them were having trouble getting in, even the ones who had tickets. Okay. And then at one point... Mike Tyson shows up, LL Cool J shows up, and everyone starts going crazy and is trying to get into the building. All right. What happened was that Puff first hired 18 of my guys to do the job for the outside. That's what we did, the outside of clubs. You know, people, we did it for Tim Dognum, all the uptown parties and everything. My crew was thorough. I had powerful, uh, slick Noah, TJ, Bunny, just just dudes that was known in the city. Then I hired some correction officers and a few cops also that you don't have problems with people online. Uh, this particular day, uh, Puff calls me the day be- the day before we supposed to do the party. Say, yo, Gene, I don't need y'all to do the security outside. I got the FOIs to do it. All right. So I said, man, I just told 18 guys. He said, I just need eight. I just need eight. I said, eight. And Slick, you know, who was at this time I had uh, left the same gang and went over to 
uh, Slick in the Family, and I started Slick in the Family with my man because uh, me and D. Ferg and them, we was cool and everything, but they was not allowing me to get the money that uh, I was thinking of all the things, the picnics, the parties and everything. So they didn't allow me to, they just only wanted to pay me to do the security. You know what I'm saying? They didn't want to, you know, him and Mike didn't want to break me into the uh, the fold and me put up a quarter of the money so we could do it together so we could, you know, break down the things that I was thinking of. So I started the own group with uh, Slick and the family. So I, Slick said, don't worry about it, Gene. We just go there with the eight guys and we just take the money and we just come back to the game room and just have fun. I said, yeah, all right, cool. So we shows up and I I see that the, that the people was already crowded out there and it was crazy. So I finagled my way in there, me and uh, Slick and them. And I said, yo, I told Puff right then and there. I say, Puff, if they don't do a boxing one outside and get these kids off the door, somebody going to die tonight. He said, Gene, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. You just handle the stars once they come inside. So I said, yeah, all right, then. So um, I, I did a walk around. So I walked around the, the, the top of the floor, went down the steps and went in the gym and then came across the gym. And I seen that you can go up the steps and be right there at the front door. So um, everybody was coming in. You seen Dougie Fresh, Red Alert. They was on the mic. Everybody start. People start coming in and everything. It was cool. And then when LL Cool J and Mike Tyson showed up, that shit must have went pandemonium. They must have broke through the first doors where the uh, FOIs was and came to the door where we was inside at. And it was a glass door that they were, they were crowded at in the glass door and people were steady pushing the people through the door, whereas that they pushed the people so hard that the glass broke and people fell through the glass doors at the top of the stairs. And when people fell through the door at the top of the store, we grabbed this girl, you know, and she was pregnant. We later found out that was Father MC's baby's mother. And she died that day with her, with her baby inside her. And you could see that she was pregnant. You know what I'm saying? She had to be like six or seven months pregnant. So we grabbed her and helped, helped her up. And then she ended up going downstairs when we had got her out the way. So they got trapped down the stairs. After they broke through the first glass, they got trapped downstairs through the, um, the second door because Jessica had got scared. That was Putney Puffy partner at the time, Jessica Rosenberg. She got scared, ran downstairs with the uh, money box and shut the door behind her. And all those people got shut down in there and got trapped. Right. Nine people died that day. 29 others were injured. And I guess uh, Nice and Smooth's bodyguard were, was one of the people that got killed? My man, let me tell you something. I, that dude was about 6'4". He had a white T-shirt on, I think, with khaki pants. I was over there trying to resuscitate him. And I was like, this shit is crazy. So, um, it, was, it, was, it was just, it was, it, was, it was just that crazy. That big dude died there too. So you didn't have to be a certain size. He was about 6'4", man. Yeah, sad. Uh, a very sad day to see that much death and, and destruction right in front of you. Right. Was that the first time you'd actually seen people dying? Uh, no. Nah. Okay. Not at all. But in that fashion, though. In, in, in that fashion, yeah. In that fashion. Yeah. I've never seen, you know, you see people get shot. You see people, you know, situations like that. But in that fashion, yeah, that's crazy. Well, uh, seven years later, a judge actually placed 50% of the blame on the people's deaths on the City University of New York and 50% on the promoters, which is Heavy D and Puffy and, and Jessica Rosenberg. Uh, but I don't think anyone actually went to prison or anything else like that over that. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And because that incident, Puffy got fired from Uptown. Yes, he did. We put and him on suicide you, watch. Oh, he wanted to kill himself. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, you, you feel partially responsible for nine people dying, including a pregnant woman, which is technically 10, if you think about it. Yeah. I think yeah. that he was on suicide watch because he thought he lost everything. 
Yeah, that too. Uh, and then you kind of separate yourself from Puffy at that point? Uh, I separated myself from Puff. Yo, I wasn't okay. dealing with him no more. But he still was a part okay. of the same gang. And uh, D. Ferg loved him. D. Ferg had uh, some kind of genuine love for this cat. Like, yo, we got to look out for him, man. He talking about committing suicide. And he talking about, you know, doing crazy shit to himself, man. We got to watch him, man. He don't know how he going to feed his baby. You know, I think Tim Dog and Eddie F. from Heavy D and the Boys was paying his bills or something at the time. And D. Ferg was helping him out. I was like, if that's the way you feel, let him kill himself. Well, ultimately, him leaving Uptown allowed him to create Bad Boy Records. And he ended up launching that, I think, with Arista uh, backing him. But see, Bad Boy Records were going to be created anyway. That was with Corey, I think Corey Jacobs. That's the guy who him, uh, L. Lamont something, they got caught in Virginia. They was all part of Butt Naked. And this is all documented in federal records. They got nine 16 of life sentences. And they was the, the the money and the backing of Bad Boy records. You understand? Uh -huh. So okay. that's before he even got with Arista. You know what I'm saying? So they gave him the avenue that you buy the studio time to get, get the money to the artists and the people that they was going to be a part of. You know what I'm saying? That's what a lot of crews back at that time was doing. Uh, they was washing their money either in doing... Um, the record business or either they were doing it and doing promotion and parties. Right, right. Okay, so you separate yourself from Puffy. Right. You're, you're doing your own thing. And then there was a situation where there was, a, I guess, an event that the Lost Boys were at and you and Wolf, who was one of Puff Puffy's bodyguards, ended up getting into it. Right. Uh, I didn't know Wolf at the time. Wolf actually got into it with Slick because Wolf was trying to shake down Tim Dog, who was actually doing the party with him. We didn't know what the circumstance in the situation was. And uh, my brothers and them was all from St. Louis. They were up and we were all partying. We were having a good time, even though we were working for Tim that night to watch them in the Lost Boys. And um, I see from a distance that uh, Slick got Wolf trapped over, got him in the corner with his hand on his chest up by his throat, telling him to chill out. They knew each other. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? So then uh, uh, we kind of like broke it up. And, Wolf, and Slick told me that Wolf was trying to, uh, you know, grab up on Tim. And I told him that I got him tonight. You know, I'm bodyguarding him tonight. I'm, I'm with him tonight. Just chill out. And Wolf wouldn't chill out, so he snatched Wolf up. So then next thing you know, Wolf had walked away. And um, I walked with Tim. We were going over to, I guess, where they were shut the front door where they was, you know, the people were coming in there. And then I ne next thing I know, I heard a shot in the air a loud shout, and it was like, now what, Slick? Now what, Slick? Slick, now what? And I looked over there. It was this guy, Wolf, that I didn't know at the time, in the middle of the party, and everybody running crazy. You know what I'm saying? And it appeared to me that he may have did the shooting in the air, but I didn't know for sure. All I could hear him say was, now what, Slick? So I just ran as fast as I could, towards him and put my elbow right on the side of him. He fell down and he got shook and I just stood on top of him, grabbed him. And next thing you know, NYPD was there. Uh, okay. So, so that situation happened. Right. And then a bit after that in Atlanta, uh, Suge's best friend, Big Jake gets killed in a club. Right. And this part is kind of fuzzy, but there was a rumor that Wolf was the one that did it. Uh, Puffy got blamed for it and, and so forth. But I guess Wolf wasn't the one who did it, but but still there was some sort of blame that Suge had on Bad Boy over that situation, right? Uh, I don't know if Suge had blamed Bad Boy for that because 
uh, the situation never came when I got with him. It, the situation never came to us like that. Now, I've heard Wolf talk about it and Wolf told me personally that he didn't do it. And I know everybody knew the guy who did it. It was this dude. He's dead now. He got killed in Atlanta about two or three years ago. His father was from the Bronx and he owned the cleaners. Now, did Wolf and them know him? Yeah, they probably knew him. He was from the Bronx, his part of town. His father owned the cleaners. They knew this guy. You understand? Uh, him and Jake was arguing over this chick or whatever. Now, did Wolf do it? How could Wolf do it when he was next to Suge? He was right next right. to Suge when Jake got killed. But everybody want to say Wolf did it because that glamorized the situation. Right. Right. Okay. And then after that, Wolf actually reached out to you and asked you to come back to Bad Boy and help out with security. Well, I told Wolf he had to straighten out his thing with Slick. We met on 125th Street, me, Slick, Rico, and Wolf. Him and Slick talked and everything, and they was cool and everything. So he said, yo, Gene, I need you to come because we need somebody who was in law enforcement illegal that could carry a gun and everything to be with us. He said, and if you ran after me, and this was his own words, because I didn't see it and I didn't know it at the time. You know, he said, if you ran after me and I had a gun in my hand, I want you on my team. I said, I don't fuck with Puff like that, bro. He said, from the city college here. He said, yo, you're going to have your own contract. You're going to have your own days. All you got to do is listen to me and make sure he good. I said, all right, man, we'll see. And that's when I went back. Okay, so you joined the security team right. uh, at Bad Boy with your own contract. Right. Right. And Wolf was already over there and Big Paul was over there as well. Paul, yeah. Yeah, Polly. Yeah. Uh, and Polly was kind of Puffy's everyday guy. Yeah, Paul was the guy who uh, Puff helped, helped him set up uh, a security uh, company, had him set up a security cut. So he did the security at the house, the uh, apartment building or whatever, and Sean John and over at Bad Boy and the studios. So he, he, he set up all the security for those places. Uh, okay. And when you joined, you were Puffy's personal security as well? Puff. That's all I did was Puff. Okay. And I guess every so often, Puffy will put you with Big during certain events and so forth, right? Well, like if we was on stage or Big was on stage, he felt he felt threatened for Big, I guess. He said, yo, Gene, go watch Big. I said, all right, cool. It wouldn't matter. Okay. So you doing some work for Biggie, did the two of you kind of form a relationship? I think me and Big, uh, we formed a relationship on on two occasions. One, we was in... Uh, D.C. doing Howard University, he made Puff shut the door down and uh, the people shut the door down. And it was D-Rock. I think D-Rock birthday is the 17th. Mine's the 16th of October. And he made him shut down the place. And um, just me and D-Rock could buy like five outfits together. And then everybody else bought an outfit. And then uh, Big used to just give me all the clothes that he didn't want. Like, you know, you had Nike, Lugs. You had Mecca, Mecca clothing line. They would bring big boxes to Big everywhere he was at. And then he was like, yo, whatever he didn't want, he'd say, yo, D-Rock, you want this? D-Rock was like, nah, I don't want it. He said, yo, Big Gene, you want it? And then I was like, man, I'll take it. I'll take it and give it to the guys on the block, you know, who was with our part of our crew or whatever. But uh, the kid was just good like that. And then we had a situation when we were uh, in Atlanta that uh, something was bought. And he thought I was going to lie about it because Puff was trying to say it was his and it wasn't his. It was Biggs. And you understand? Know and and when he said and they had made a bet that I was going to go on Puff's side. So when I got to the studio, I said, nah, Puff, you had that one and Big had that one. And that's what it was. And Big looked at me and you could see a smile on his face like, yo, this nigga's honorable. OK. And, and before all the drama began, did Tupac ever come around? Did you ever see Big and Tupac interact together? No, I've never seen Big and Tupac interact together. I've seen uh, Puff okay. and Pac interact together, but I didn't oh, see really? Big, yeah. In, in what capacity? Like we was at uh, uh, Roxy. They used to give uh, functions and, and, and um, parties there. 
And then one time me and Puff walked up in there. It was, um, this was after Pac got shot and everything like that. And it was Pac and like four other guys. And uh, a Pac, Pac put a cigarette in his mouth and the dude lit the cigarette. I started laughing. I was like, who the fuck like a cigarette for? <laughs> like that. So then uh, him and Puff talked and that was it. It was nothing. Okay, and then the incident happened at Quad Studios. This was after the where... incident at Quad, when I seen Pac with Puff. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, when the situation happened at Quad, uh, Biggie was recording, I think, with Lil Sean. And uh, I think Puffy was there. Uh, Lil C's was there. Probably some other the Junior I Mafia think, guys. I think Big was uh, uh, recording with the Junior Mafia. And Lil Sean was showing, uh, uh, Sean was uh, recording on his own. Ah, and okay. Puff was in there with, uh, Puffer came down there, but he was um, with Jimmy Henchman and Andre around them in another part of the studio. Right. And uh, Tupac was over there, I guess, to lay a verse. And as he was getting ready to go up this, you know, the elevator, two guys ambushed him, uh, shot him, robbed him. And then started some level of friction between between Bad Boy and Tupac at that point. Well, I don't think it was between Bad Boy and Tupac at that point. Not at all. Pac knew where that came from. You know what I'm saying? This is from, from the streets and over the years. Pac at that time knew where it came from. He knew Bad Boy had nothing to do with it because uh, I'm going to just say his name is Zeke. He was Pac friend who was actually there with him. He's a good dude of mine. You know what I'm saying? And I know him. You know, me and him have conversations. He's a good brother, spiritual brother. He personally told me, he said, yo, I was there. You know what I'm saying? He was there with Pac that night that it happened. And he said to me that the next day, Big, he went with Big and Big got the gun out the piano and he went to the hospital to see Pac the next day. So Pac knew that that had nothing to do with Big at that time because his man told him and made him understand that. After the fact, I remember Pac did an interview about it and he was like, you know, look, this dude is supposed to be the king of New York. This happened in New York. You know, I... You know, I, w- I didn't expect me to tell, me, you know, Big to tell me who it was, but I expected a certain level of support and help. And he kind of compared it to the situation when Tretch got into it with the Rolling Sixties. Pac went out of his way to try to kind of remedy the situation and so forth. And I guess he just felt like as his friend, Biggie wasn't really trying to stand close to him during the situation. Brother, you can't expect another man to do what you do. And the way that you roll as an individual, you can only hope and pray that somebody would do the same for you. But everybody ain't built or cut from that cloth. You understand? Big had told y'all his man got killed on his block. He didn't go around his own block no more after that. You understand? He knew that that king of New York shit was only the phrase that came from the, the, the movie. What was that? With, uh, Christopher uh, Walken? Christopher Walken. Walken. Yeah. What's that, King of New York? Was, right. was that the movie? That was the movie. Yeah. He said, that, that phrase only came from the movies. It's nobody the king of New York. You understand what I'm saying? New York got too many boroughs. New York got too many spots. And some of the guys in Brooklyn won't go to the Bronx. Some of the guys in Bronx definitely won't go to Brooklyn. Manhattan, stay clear both of them. You understand? So it ain't no king of New York. You know what I'm saying? So you have guys that are strong in their areas and are known, but he knew that was a bunch of bullshit. Big could not give Puff Pac any money when Jasmine and Jada Pickett came to him because Big was, he didn't have no money to give Pac. And nobody was smart enough to say, yo, Big, do a show for your man. Do a, do a, get a club and all the money you make on the door, let that go to Pac defense. You understand? He couldn't get nothing to Pac for his, for his, uh, I guess when he was trying to um, get his, uh, his sense, what Suge did, he was trying to get his, he was trying to get the money to get uh, out of jail. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
So Big didn't give him nothing. So Pac probably used that. And then now he was messing with Puff heavy. He doing the whole bad boy thing and him and Puff didn't like each other. Okay, so that situation happened. And, you know, and from what I heard also was that when Pac got caught up in that that rape case right around that same time, Biggie had left the guns, had left his guns in Pac's room and Pac ended up, you know, taking that charge. He didn't say that it was Biggie's gun and so forth. So there, there was some friction going on between him and Big on a personal level. Well, when I spoke to Big, when we was out in LA, he didn't know why dude was acting like that. And that's what he said to me. I don't know yeah. why dude is acting like that, man. Okay, so Pac ends up getting convicted of the, of the situation with Ayanna Jackson. He ends up getting locked up. And then things sort of escalate in their own way. So Biggie releases Who Shot Ya? And I remember speaking to the producer of that song, and he told me it had nothing to do with Tupac. But from your point of view, you felt like that Puffy knew putting that song out right after Tupac got shot would create that level of controversy. Well, anybody with any sense know that if your man just got shot, you understand, and there's a little beef that the people who are involved, they tell guys records that they can't do. You understand? The, the, uh, you'll do a record, and here it is, the, the uh, not the producer, but you, Clyde Davis or Diddy or something. No, you can't do that record. You can't do that record. They knew that wasn't a good time to put that record out, but they knew that record would bring on a lot of controversy. That record would bring on a lot of emotions from the people because people would automatically think, oh, he talking about big. He talking about Tupac. Everybody thought he was talking about Tupac. Why wouldn't yeah. they? You understand? So it wasn't a good idea for a streetwise to put that out there. But business wise, it was great. Big wasn't doing that well. Big's first six months wasn't that well until he did the song with Craig Mack. Well, right after Who Shot you comes out, uh, the Dog Pound is out in New York with Snoop recording New York, New York, which originally was supposed to be an homage to New York rappers, right? Because it, it takes the, the same title as the, the Melly Mel song and so forth. But as they're out in Brooklyn somewhere filming this music video, and, I, and I've talked to people who, who heard this, you know, who were with the Dog Pound, like Trey D and Corrupt and all them, uh, Big gets on the radio and was like, yo, New York, we looking soft out here. The Dog Pound is shooting this music video out there. We're looking soft. And then a shooting happened on the set of the music video. No one actually got hit, but, you know, the actual music video set gets shot up. And then when the music video finally comes out, Snoop is like kicking over a bunch of New York buildings and stuff like that. So now the thing escalates again. Right. Do you remember that time? I remember. Okay. Why did Biggie go on the radio and kind of escalate things? Me and you, I couldn't answer that. I couldn't answer what the next man, why he did it. You know what I mean? It was his choice. He, he Come on, man. When you young, dumb, and full of cum, and your testosterone levels up that high, you know, you might say anything. But as you get older, you know, and he if he had the opportunity to have gotten older, he probably wouldn't have said it then or, or probably regretted that he said it. Yeah. So my point is, is that the escalation is kind of, you know, between bad boy and death row is now getting a little, a little more serious. Now there's, there's shootings and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Right. Okay. So Tupac is out. He's with death row. He's blowing up. Uh, bad boy is blowing up. Right. Uh, and then there was a situation where Suge takes a photo with Puffy's baby mother and his son. Right. Tell me about that. Um, I don't know if it was one of the press guys, but we were out and about. And I think um, we were about to go in. 
uh, Puff was like, yo, I'm tired, man. I'm going in. You know what I'm saying? And I was happy because, you know, once he go in, I'm done for the night. And so then, here come Wolf. Always stirring up shit with this cat. Yo, Wolf came and he said, yo, Puff, look at this. And he had a, a magazine. I think it was one of those uh, those artist press magazines. I don't know what it is, but it was from Death Row. And Suge was in the magazine with Misa with his arms around Misa while she had Justin in her arm. And it said, the caption said, what the East Coast won't take care of, the West Coast will. Yo, I seen a vein come across that kid's forehead and then neck. And then he got on the phone. He was screaming and hollering. I don't know when we, yo, we must have stayed out until the next morning. Then I had to be there at nine o'clock again. You know what I'm saying? Because it was on the weekend. But he was, he was, he was livid. He was, he was, he was going crazy behind that. Do you think that photo was the real start of the East Coast, West Coast beef? I think that photo, what it did was for Puff, it was no coming back from it. Because before they did hit him up, uh, Eric B had a conversation with Suge. This is what I've heard from, 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 from Chaz. Eric B and Big D and them had a conversation with uh, uh, Suge and say, yo, you got to tell Pac, he got to do something. He got to direct his anger towards the people that uh, uh, he was mad at. So he has to let the people know who's he talking about because he can't keep saying all New York niggas is fake, phony, and uh, faggots or whatever he was saying about New York cats. So he has to get that shit straight. So Pac did the song, hit him up and directed all the people that he was mad at. He said who he is mad at and put their names out there because they was going to start the death row East Coast. You know what I'm saying? So Eric B and Big D was going to be over that. You know what I'm saying? So uh, he directed that information to them. And prior to that, they were all out here in New York and they were trying to have a meeting to squash the shit between Big and Puff. Puff didn't want to have nothing to do with it. Big and Pac and Puff didn't want to have nothing to do with it. Well, when Hit Em Up dropped and, you know, hip hop fans can argue, but I think most people would say that is the greatest diss record of all time. Nah, not at all. Okay, I, I would say that. Like I said, people will argue, pe some people say no Vaseline, some people will say, you know, back to back, uh, whatever. Like, there is an argument, but it's in that conversation no matter who you talk to. How's yeah, that? But if you want to talk about diss tracks, The Goat, LL Cool J, <laughs> he okay. was the also also he was the also massive, in the conversation. He was a massive in a diss track is when you can end somebody's career. Right. When With LL cannabis. got on the track and he dissed you, he ended your career. Okay. Fair All right? enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But I, I would say that up until that time, Hit Him Up was the most vicious and personal diss record that I had heard. He he started off talking about I fucked your bitch. Like he really, Pac really crossed a lot of lines mm. with that particular with that particular record. When that dropped, and it was a hit song on top of it, it was being played in the clubs and, and, and the whole nine. Right. Uh, when that record dropped, how did Puffy take it? I don't I don't know how he took it, but nobody really even discussed it or said anything about it. It wasn't like it was like, you know, because they knew Big could have got back at him if he wanted to, but they they took the high road. Yeah. But he wasn't, yeah, I get, he didn't discuss it that much. You know what I'm saying? He was upset when like we went in the clubs and place that people played it and everything like that. But uh, right. he didn't do nothing about it. Right. From what I understand, Puff was telling Biggie not to really go back and forth with Pac and, and start a whole, yeah. you know, back and forth rap beef during that time, which, you know, and, and Big kind of touched a little bit on Pac, you know, like if we had twins, they probably have Tupac, get it, Tupac. Mm. But he didn't really go hard at, at Tupac the same way that Pac went, went at him. Well, Puff, uh, Big had to listen to Puff 
you know, he had to listen to Puff because Puff owned his publishing and his uh, marketing and, mm -hmm. and marketing and he wanted it back. He found out how important that was for artists and somebody in this business. So he had to listen to him. He had to, you know, go against what he may have even thought uh, was right or wrong. This nigga on my marketing, on my public, I got to listen to him. I got to do these things. You understand? But when I was in the Winnebago with him, he said, man, next motherfucker mention my name on some wax, I'm going to tie ass up. All right. Now, I remember Biggie did an interview about that. He said that when he was still recording his first album, he was broke. He was fucked up. And he approached Puff for some extra money. Puff was like, well, you could sell me back part of your publishing for like, I don't know, I think it was like 25000 or some some real small amount. And Big did it, not really realizing the implications of it. He and gave him 200000 well, you know, I don't know how much it was. I don't know how much publishing that entail, but I bet you it was more than 25% or 50% of it for right. 200000 And he told right. me, he said, yo, listen here, man, the people who were managing me didn't know what the fuck they were doing at the time. But they all worked for Puff and they got their schooling from Puff. So what else they going to do? Yeah. Okay, so Hit 'Em Up comes out. Things are are becoming, you know, more heated between the two camps. And then they run into each other at the Soul Train Awards. Right. And you were actually Puff's bodyguard that night. Yes, sir. Okay. But you guys weren't actually part of the altercation when Big and Tupac ran into each other. Not at all. Okay, so We were me running. We heard it over the radio. So me and Puff is running. And trying to get that, the next thing you know, this little light-skinned Muslim guy stops Puff. And we about to get into it with these Muslim guys. And I ain't know what the hell was going on, you know, but I'm not going to let them touch Puff. And they wanted to talk to him, so they surrounded us. You understand? And it was about, about six of them. And this dude was trying to talk to Puff, and I'm moving him. You know, I got Puff in one arm and I'm moving him. Come on, let's go right there. Until Mustafa saw us. Mustafa is Farrakhan's son. And then Mustafa said, brother, back up. Dude didn't move. And then Mustafa said it again. He said, yo, brother, back up. They with me. Dude was like was crazy heated. And then Mustafa got in his face, hard body, like brother, real hard. And you know, like, and I was like, oh shit, this shit about to go. You know what I'm saying? The next thing you know, Nation of Islam guys start running, coming from everywhere. You know, so they backed up and me and Puff took off running to the corridor. As we was running to the corridor, uh, I see Pac and, and Suge and the rest of them come right there. And we're at the end of the edge where you, if you take this left, you have to jump down into where the televisions and the media was at. Uh, it was like a little small embankment or whatever like that that you could jump down into. So Puff was on my left, Puff was on my left, Puff was right here behind me and they coming and I, they, they talking amongst each other. I see him and I, see, I looked at Puff and I just said to him, I said, yo Puff, don't worry about nothing, bro. I got this. Just take care of my family. You know what I mean? And when I looked the other way, next thing you know, he jumped down in the embankment and took off running. And I just put my back against the wall and they just walked past me. And that's when Pac got that award for uh, album, I think, or, or something of the year, uh, rap of the year or whatever like that. I did a really extensive interview with Keefe D. And Keefe D is, you know, associated with the Southside Crips. Now, he was saying that around that time, you know, Keefe and the Southside guys were around Puffy going to some of his shows and having various meetings and so forth. Before Hit Him Up, was Puffy approaching y'all for for security and protection? No, he had, uh, he had had a West Coast he had had a West Coast uh, tour coming up. Okay. San Diego, San Jose, you know, little areas, Anaheim, LA, stuff like that, Vegas. So he, he called one night, man, Zip. I don't know whether they had set this up or not, but Zipper came and picked me up. We rolling up Greenleaf in our neighborhood. 
and his phone ring, boom, and it, it, it was Puff. And he's like, you think it's cool to come out here and do concerts? I'm like, why it wouldn't be cool? So he like, the big CEO dude. So. Sugar. Yeah. Yeah, i like, damn. What's going on with y'all? He like, man, uh, shit, you think it's just cool? I'm like, shit, just let me know the dates and uh, give me some tickets. We had a Crips there. But I see he was trying to play us against each other. Crips, Bloods, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Crip, uh, sugar, Blood, we the Crips. So I guess that was, that was his protection thing going. Okay, so he just gave you guys some tickets to a show. Yeah. Now, how did you see you know, Keefe and the South Side guys, you know, from your point of view? Well, I would only see the head, the the, the, uh, the head knockers, you know, Keefe D and whoever he brought with him. And they usually meet up in the hotel to come. He didn't bring the whole South Side Crips and everything. Like, it'd be like one or two of them. And they'll come upstairs and they love to gamble. So it'd be Zip, D-Mac, Puff, a couple of Crips. And uh, we, they'd be in there, they'd be gambling. That's it. You know, shooting dice. And one day it was the first time I met uh, Keefe. It was uh, it was Tretch, uh, Arnell Simpson, uh, D Mac, Puff, Zip, and they were we were sitting in the hotel room and they were gambling. It's the first time I met. Them. Okay, and, and you know, based on conversations I had with you, from your point of view, you said that Puffy never really directly paid. Keefe and them, he would just give them tickets to shows so it looked like, you know, and they would all show up so it looked like <laughs> they were all together, but it's not like they were actually on payroll or anything. Yeah, he was the oldest trick in the book, man. You know what I'm saying? You, you get a lot of your friends to come and give them free tickets and not look like you got a crew of guys with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I said, things are still escalating. Things are, are really bad. Right. Uh, you, uh, you did an interview with uh, Queen's Flip. And you said that uh, you heard Puffy say something. You said, I don't care if Pac got to die, I don't care if Big got to die, something has to change. Right. When did he say that? Right after the Soul Train thing. He said, um, we got back to the house. We did a, 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 a walk around. My man went upstairs. Then I did, we did a walk around. He stayed in the limousine. You understand? So now I got Chaz on the phone. And I'm like, yo, Chaz, I can't believe, man. I was about to, you know, blase, blase, whoop de whoop. And uh, this nigga ran. And he said, yeah, he ran. I said, yeah, Chaz. So Puff came in and everything like that. And then Puff went upstairs. He said, yo, he, he did what? And as Puff was walking uh, up the steps, I said, yeah, he ran, man. And he said, why you tell him I ran? Why you ain't tell him I took a left? I was like, I just took a left. He said, Chad said, what'd he say? I said, he said, why well, I tell you he ran? Uh, I should have just told him he, he took a left. And then Puff came back downstairs. He was heated. He said, yo, Gene, I got 126 employees. And these people depend on me for their livelihoods. If these white folks thought or they would think that I had anything to do with any kind of gunplay, they wasn't going to fuck with me. And they not going to fuck with me. He said, um, I'm a businessman. I'm about making money. But something got to change. I don't give a fuck if Pac got to die, Big got to die, or Suge Knight go to jail. Something's got to change. And he took upstairs. He took. He turned around and walked back upstairs. And it didn't dawn on me what he said. And then my man looked at me and Bum was like, yo, that nigga said big. I said, yo, he sure did. He said, yeah. He said, big gotta die? He said, yo, he said big. And today, I look at that as being some probably, I guess you would call that um, I'm trying to get the word for it. Foreshadowing? Not it's it's it, 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 it's 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 not foreshadowing. It's it's like he had this thought, or somebody had told the way he said it. Somebody it seemed like somebody had told him that before, or said that. You understand what I'm saying? 
uh, I don't know, bro, but the way he said it, it seemed like he had heard it before. Well, not too long after that, there was a big Tyson fight that happened in Vegas. Tupac and the Death Row guys all go down there. And Keefe D and the Southside guys are down there as well, as well as Zip is there. Uh, according to Keefe D's book, and he kind of backtracked a little bit on this, I guess that Zip was with Foxy Brown out there. Uh, so the fight happened, you know, Mike Tyson even spoke about how guilty he felt because he kept pushing Tupac to come down because Tupac had done a song that Tyson was going to use to, to walk out into the ring with. I feel a little guilty about him coming to the fight, me pressuring him for the day. Hey, you bring the tape. Don't forget the tape, you know? And I was going to go out with him that night. I promised to go to 662 with him that night. But I just had a little baby, and her mother was um, provoking me to stay home. So I stayed with the baby, and then someone called me that night and told me that happened. So so Pac is, is down there. Everyone's living their best life. And then in the lobby of the MGM, you know, Trayvon Lane uh, points out the guy that jumped him and try to take his death row chain. Tupac makes a beeline uh, towards uh, towards um, uh, Baby Lane, attacks him, a big fight happens, and then shortly afterwards, the shooting happens, and the car that Tupac and Suge uh, was in gets shot up, uh, Suge gets grazed, Tupac gets killed. And you know, I did a very extensive interview with Keefe D about this, where he admitted that he was in the car that, that killed Tupac. He didn't say who the shooter was, but, you know, it could be one of four people. Him being one of them, we're not sure. Three of them are dead right now. Well, in the book, you said that as you're driving up towards the, towards the BMW with Suge driving and Tupac in the passenger seat, and you said that Tupac pulled out a gun. It looked like he was reaching, yeah. Yeah, it did. He okay. Was, yeah. Did you actually see a gun? No, I said, once he got the reaching, I got the ducking. So someone from your car That's what happened. started shooting at Tupac and Shook. When you heard the news that Tupac got shot in Vegas, what did you think? Um... I thought he was dead. Tupac got shot. They said they got them niggas. And that's what I heard. I heard that night. Um, it was about four or five o'clock. We were sitting on the stoop on 112th Street. And um, got a phone call from somebody who was actually with Keefe D and them. You know what I'm saying? Because what happened when Keefe and them saw them, and this is what I've heard from another individual who was there. He said, Keith, he said, we're going to go, you know, I'm going to talk to them niggas right now. You know what I'm saying? And they took a left and the other people took a right going back, whether to the hotel or whatever like that. And, um, the individual said, uh, uh, he'll tell us what happened when he comes back to New York. But he called us okay. that night. Are you talking about Zip? No, it was a dude that was with Zip. Okay, got it. I mean, according according to Keefe D, Zip was the one that provided the guns for the actual murder. I, I don't believe no. that. You don't I don't believe that? believe that. You know, for for okay. for the simple reason is is that uh, when is it the South Side Crip have a problem getting a gun? When are you going? When are you going? You traveling somewhere? You know for a fact that you going to have artillery there when you get there or whatever like that. And how is it that Zip could come all the way from New York or California and have guns and they can't? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and they were driving. It's not like the Southside right. guys were flying and right. couldn't bring guns with them. They were on a Cadillac and yeah, right. that, that makes sense. Uh, okay. And then, you know, Keefe in our interview claimed that after, uh, after Tupac got shot, Puffy called and said, you know, was that us? Mm -hmm. 
which, uh, you know, at this point is just hearsay. Yeah. Okay. When, you know, and it took Tupac a few days to actually pass away. You know, in the beginning, everyone thought that he was going to make it. And then as the days progressed, you kept hearing worse and worse news until finally you heard that he passed away. Okay, so after the situation happened and Tupac eventually passes away, with, with Tupac being the main spokesman of the beef, the one that was doing the songs and the one that was doing the interviews and kept attacking everyone, how did everyone at Bad Boy feel when Tupac passed away? Was it a sense of relief or was it like, oh no, this is about to escalate even further? Well, we knew it may escalate it further, but a sense of relief, I don't think relief. Big was devastated. He was so devastated that he got smoked out of his mind, gave uh, Lucy's the keys, they got smoked out of their mind and they had an accident and Big went through the car window. Could have killed, it could, he could have been dead then. He broke okay, both so, of the fibular so, bones in his body. So you're saying that accident that happened between Big and Lil C's, the car accident, was almost like a side effect of Tupac dying? Yeah, that night. That, 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 it, was, it was like when he oh. heard the news, it was that night. Or the, ah. You know what I'm saying? He gets smokes out of his mind because, yo, the kid was hurt. You know what I mean? Behind his Pac, you know, behind his relationship with Pac. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, And then, you know, like... It, it, it wasn't going to get any better until people sat down. And still in all, it wasn't big that needed to sit down with anybody. It was Puff. Yeah. Well, Keefe talked about, you know, various meetings he had with Puff. And there's words thrown out, you know, according to Keefe, that, that Puff said, well, you know, I'll, I'll pay a million dollars to make this problem go away and so forth. Um, and then after, you know, Tupac passed away, you know, there was a rumor that a payment went, you know, from Puffy's camp and it was supposed to go to Keefe D and the Southside guys. And according to TK Kirkland, Zip got that money, and he kept it for himself. Well, the story that has circulated was that after Tupac got killed, Puffy allegedly gave the money I heard. To, to Zip. Yes. And Zip was supposed to give the money to, to Keefe in there. Yes. But he never gave the money to but him. But thank God he never gave him the money, right? Think about it. If he gave the money, Puffy would be in prison now, money for hire, a murder for hire. So thank God, if, if, if this is a true story, I, I'm not saying yes or no, but if he would have gave him them the money, it would have been a murder for hire and Puffy would be locked up. Now, you had mentioned something about a check. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, I could talk about it. I mentioned it on uh, Doggy Diamond platform and I had, you know, I told MREC, and some other people, if anything happened to me, this is all what happened. They got they got the whole tape. They got everything that, you know, that went down or whatever like that, that I said, and I've already said it. Um, what happened was, is that you had to understand who Zip was. You know, Zip was a mastermind, a gangster, a pimp, uh, a, a hustler. And he, he had more game than catalogs had flakes, brother. You understand? So... Just for instance, I'm, I, I, before I break this check thing down to you, Zip used to do shit like that. He have 20 guys in the club with him, right? And he gonna say, yo, we got all these girls, we got chicks. We got, we gonna get 20 bottles of champagne, five bottles of uh, Grey Goose or Belvedere, and we gonna get five bottles of Hennessy. Now, he'll tell all 20 of the guys, I need like four, 500 from each one of y'all. You understand? Because they know in the club, bottles are $200 and better. You know what I mean? So we could drink all night and we, you know, we could show how the girls like that. Boom. Zip already went to the manager and most managers and people in the clubs thought he was Puff's uncle. He already went to them and made a deal with them on the bottles. You understand? So... <laughs> These guys are giving them two to $500, you know what I'm saying, 
giving their money out. He's getting the bottles at cost. You understand? Because he's getting so many. You understand? Yeah. And when he go to get the manager some money, it's only a tip for the bartenders. Because <laughs> he already right. paid for that. You know what I mean? Right. And, and to expand on that, when I interviewed Mike Tyson, he went into this whole story about how he was hanging out and Don King showed up with 600000 in cash for a fight. And Zip basically finessed Don King out of that 600000 basically grabbed the money and shooed Don King out the room before any contracts got signed. And basically, the two of them spent that 600000 themselves. Zip took, Zip took like six, Zip took the $600,000. Really? Yeah. From who? From Don, when he came in with the money, he was trying to do something. And then Zip said, Zip said, let's come, let's come back later and we'll talk yeah. about that. He's walked them out the door. He said, hey, man, let me get some of that money to pay some people. I got to pay some people. <laughs> WBC, the dog, it's, the dog, come back. He's come back. And Zip, you never met Zip, have you? I haven't, no. Zip is such a gentleman. It's, dog, it's, please come back. Zip. Not right now, now. He's, he's just not feeling well, dog. Click, click, bye. <laughs> and then we're thinking about it. We're like, wow, we're going to have a party. Let's get some bitches. Let's get everything. We got to do it tonight. So... Zip is known for just robbing people in various types of ways. I wouldn't say robbing them, you know what I'm saying? Well, because ain't nobody kinda. took him in, in, to court. Right, F <laughs> finessing, finessing people, yeah. basically. Finessing people. I told finessing you he had, more, he had more gang than Kellogg had flakes, man. You know what I'm saying? He could okay. talk a well out of water. So now, All right. um, after Pac got killed and um, we heard about you know, somebody got a check or something like that. Zip came up on my man's spot because, you know, he used to always try to, you know, show him new cars and everything. Every time he got something new, he would come on the block, our block, and show it to us, either to the game room or on the block when we was cooking or whatever we were doing. And he came up there, and I heard TK, TK Kirkland interview with you. He said he got a check for five. It wasn't no check for no $500,000. Zip had a check in his right pocket, right back pocket, and that check was for a million dollars. He said he got the, uh, Jimmy Hinchman got him the check from Barry Hankerson or something like that. Barry Hankerson, I think, you know, there was a Leah uncle or manager or something like that, gave him that check for Black Ground Records. That's what he said. Follow the paper. I didn't know he had a record label. I didn't know he had a record company, Black Ground label, but that's what he said he got the check for. You understand? Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one that's seen the check. There's other people that I'm not going to mention their name, but they know, you know, they know who I am because we already discussed it and talked about it. You understand? And I told people that I was going to let them know, let the people know. He had a check for a million dollars, but he said mm -hmm. he, that Jimmy Hinchman got it for him from Barry Hankerson for Black Ground Records. I okay. didn't know he had a well, record company. Well, ultimately, Keefe D and them never got the check, which in the grand scheme of things probably worked out best if Puff actually did write a check for that because otherwise you'd be connected to that situation. So, you know, Eric Von Zip keeping the money kind of shielded everyone from the situation. In, in its own so he's a savior. Type of way. Yeah, <laughs> in a way. In, in a he's way. a savior. <laughs> Yeah, and, and rest in peace, uh, yeah. Eric Von Zip. Yeah. He ended up passing away some years later, I think, from cancer. Right. So whatever stories Zip has essentially died. But, but it, that's crazy. You know, that cancer, you know, you know, that cancer didn't show up until after he got shot. Mm. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was crazy. I used to work this club. See, everybody trying to say I didn't know Zip. I knew Zip just like I knew the back of my hand. I think I even told you how for my birthday he brought two prostitutes up to me and be like, yo, here go chocolate, here go vanilla. He was holding them like this. He's like, here go, here go chocolate, here go vanilla. It's your birthday. You can have them both and be greedy. Or you could take one or I could take one. I say, yo, Unc, I'm good. You can have, I'm good. You can have a room. And I went down to the tour bus. You know, he was general like that. He ate my food. I love to cook. I used to cook for everybody on the block. You know what I'm saying? He used to come eat off. We used to make fried turkeys from macaroni and cheese, greens, cornbread, all that shit like that. And Zip used to always come down. We knew him. You know what I'm saying? When he had an issue or problem, you know what I'm saying? It's people who and Slick and the family that he called to make sure that he wouldn't have no problems. You understand? So yeah. I knew Zip very well. You know what I mean? I worked at his club. Well, the the situation with Tupac happened. Tupac's pa you know, Tupac passes away. Uh, Biggie 
and Bad Boy are still moving forward and, you know, doing their thing. Uh, you know, uh, Biggie ended up dropping Hypnotize, which was a, a massive hit, mm-hmm. you know. If anyone thought that Biggie just had one one solid album, you know that pretty much changed the whole playing field. Big, huge, huge budget video and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then, leading up to March 9th, uh, nineteen ninety seven, I guess Biggie had already finished his album, and he went out to L.A. to work on Puffy's album. Correct. O- okay, and I guess leading up to the to that night, Mace was at a celebrity basketball game with the dog pound of death row guys. And I guess he was told that, hell, yo, the beef is still on. There's still a lot of tension. There's still a lot of bad feelings over this, right? Correct. Yes, you were. Okay. So then Mace told that to to Big, to Puff, to both? I don't know if he told it to Big, but I know he told it to Puff. Okay. You know and when saying? Puff heard that, what did he, how did he react? I think Puff didn't really give two shits and a shake for it. You know what I'm saying? Because you got to realize this kid was a young kid and he was, I'm going to just be straight blatant. He got, he got his girl, Kim Porter, out there. He fucking Sally Richardson. You know what I'm saying? I'm staying in the room. You know, next time we got the presidential suite. I got a room. He got the room. I'm right there. I'm the one who answered the door and everything. So he's fucking Sally Richardson and everything like that. So he's the man. You know what I'm saying? So he didn't give a fuck. He, yo, man, we was running around. Me and him was running around L.A. going to the House of Blues. We were going to the movies. We were just going out there. We see Dre and them sitting out there on Melrose eating. You know, we were going over like he didn't have a care in the world. So, you know, I don't know if it was because he was young, dumb, or he was stupid. I don't know what he thought it was. But when Mace told him that, I thought that we wasn't going to go around because I never was ever the individual to say, yo, let's not go here. Let's not do this. Let's not do that. I, you know, I'm young, dumb too. Then and I'm, 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 I'm for the, I'm for the bullshit. If it, if it, whatever it is, I'm for it. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to make sure you're going to be all right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know why Puff was like on some shit. Like he didn't give a fuck. Okay, so you guys are out in L.A., and I guess Biggie is not really going to any of the clubs at I all. I see Big. You know, much- you know where I seen Big at? I seen Big at the studio after the fight with Charlie Baltimore. You understand? And I seen him um, at the Peterson Museum. He didn't go to none okay. of the places we were at and all the video shoot. Okay, so you mentioned Charlie Baltimore. So I guess right before the incident, him and his girlfriend, Charlie Baltimore, get into like a domestic dispute where I guess he he put some hands on her. Yeah. She had seen some pictures of him with some other girls. I guess she threw his Rolex and his ring out the window. And You must have seen my program, Vlad. You must have, you was looking at the Gene Deal show, man. Stop I, that I bullshit, watching. Vlad. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> I, I've been doing research. And yeah. I guess, mm. you know, Police showed up and potentially could have arrested Big for that. Right. And me and Puff talked him out of it. And uh, Charlie never gave up no name or said anything. They rolled Big out the uh, hotel. And I feel kind of fucked up behind that, but it's life. You know, because if he got arrested, uh, he wouldn't be able to go to no parties. Under that okay, new OJ but, law that they put out for domestic violence at the time. Right. When the police show up for domestic violence, someone has to get arrested. Yeah. Because when they didn't arrest OJ time and time again, Nicole ended up getting murdered later on and yeah. LAPD got blamed for it. Partially, of course. Okay. So then then the night of March 9th, 1997, there was a big vibe party at the Peterson Museum uh, in LA. I guess Puffy talks Biggie into actually attending? Yo, that whole week, man, Puff was like, yo, man, yo, Big, you got to come to this party. And uh, I got, he was like, yeah, yeah, all right, all right, because now he, you know, I know why he was calling him Diddy. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, all right, Diddy, all right. He like, he said, yeah. So then Puff was like, yo, Big, you got to go to this party. 
you know, and I, he wasn't getting the uh, response that he needed from Big to make sure that he was going to the party. So um, this was real eye. Puff came one day and he had Sally Richardson, her makeup person, and his other chick, I think. And he said, yo, I need D-Rock to ride with me. And then he said, Gene, you stay here with Big. And I was like, which was weird. So D-Rock stayed gone the whole day with Puff. And that never, that never, that never happened, you know. So I guess the chick liked D-Rock or whatever, whatever. Uh, that's what Puff wanted her to do. And next thing you know, um, I've gotten phone calls. I got a phone call from Unique from Mecca Audio, right? And Unique from Mecca Audio say, yo, vest up. You know, those guys is coming to get y'all. I tell Chaz, the day of the party, I spoke to Chaz. He said, yeah, it's going to be some street shit, bro. I'm letting you know that. So now... I called my man, I forgot his name, D, his name D, but I called him, he used to fuck around with Jodeci. I asked him, was they coming to the party? Cause we going to the vibe party. And he said, nah, we ain't going. So I come in the house cause I was at the Beverly Hills Hotel and I go directly up, I say, Paul, what Puff at? He said, he upstairs with Kim. So I call him, I say, Puff, he comes to the, top of the staircase. And I say, yo, Puff, I got some intel, brother. You understand? Uh, now, Puff, no. He ain't never heard me ever tell him not to go nowhere. And I didn't tell him not to go nowhere that night. I said, Puff, I got some intel. The guys are coming to kill us tonight at the, uh, at the museum party. He said, Gene, I don't want to hear that shit. He said, you ain't got to go if you don't want to go. You understand? But I don't want to hear that. So, quiet as it kept, I'm the only one with toast. You know what I'm saying? I know Paul don't have nothing. I know D-Rock don't have nothing. I brought three with me. So, I'm thinking all kind of crazy shit. I was like, yo, damn. This motherfucker said, I ain't got to go. So I went in in, uh, uh, Andre Harrell's. He had this long wooden table in this like dining room setting. Oak wood, a beautiful table. And D-Mac, a couple of puff kids from the um, street team. And his one of his best friends, uh, what's his name? Charles. What's his, they call him Charlie something. They was all at the table and stuff like that. And I just thought, I, I just start bamming on the table. Boom, 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 boom. I said, fuck, man. And he said, uh, cause I had that feeling inside me, and some just came over. I said, yo, but I had my vest on, Alex. I said, yo, this shit's gonna go down. And then I said, somebody said, well, Gene, what's wrong with you? I said, my man, niggas is coming to kill us tonight, and y'all niggas is joking like it's a joke or something. Yeah, y'all niggas acting like this shit is a joke. Y'all talking about some fucking party. And uh, D-Max said, nigga, we lock and load together. We lock and load together. I said, I don't see nobody locking. I don't see nobody loading. I called a block, because back then you used to call on the pay phones. They had the pay phones. I called my block on 112th Street. Sean and Shay, Shay, I think Shay picked up the phone first, or I think Sean picked it up. One of them uh, picked up the phone, and I said, put Slick on the phone. I said, yo, Slick, I got a call from uh, Unique and Chad, them told me some niggas going to come, you know, get at us tonight. He said, uh, listen, brother, don't fuck with them. Don't go then. Puff said he told you not to go. Don't go. I said, nah, I ain't going to leave them kids out like that. I'm going to go. So then I hang up the phone and I read I, I did real house. I walked outside. Guess who's outside? It's big, tone, D Rock, and Lil C's and G Money. They sitting, they they in the car right there. 
Tone and D-Rock is outside. They had a Nerf football, pl- basketball playing on this, this, little, this little basketball goal. And so then I say, Big. He said, yo, what up, Gene? I said, yo, man, niggas going to try to come kill us tonight, Big. I just got some intel. Uh, Lil C said, Gene, go ahead on with that old cop shit. You think you know everything. So me and Big had had a big conversation that night and the win- that day in the Winnebago all the time that uh, that Puff and D Rock was gone, and I said when Lucy said going with that cop shit, I said yo, what you need to do, Lucy's, and get you a GED. You know what the fuck that is? He said, what's that? I say a good enough degree, so they don't cheat you out your money like they did your man right here. And I was pointing at Big. You know what I'm saying? Because we used to snap at each other, you know what I'm saying? With the Harlem and the Brooklyn shit like that. So he said to me, he said, uh, yo, Gene, go ahead with that bullshit for I have Tone Rock. Tone and D-Rock hold you while Lil C's get his shit off. I said, man, let me tell you something, bro. All that shit sound good. It may make you feel good, but it won't be healthy. And, and Big said, uh, Start laughing, and then next thing you know, Puff come walking out the door. Let's go. We all hops in the car, and we go to the Peterson Museum. So all you guys go to the Vibe Party. It was 23 of us. 23 people go to the Vibe Party. And then at one point, the fire department starts to shut it down. Now it's only 12 of us. Because them, them motherfuckers that left, they must have felt something. You know, uh, what's the name? Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Bone. That was Puff friend. Yeah, he that was with us. Chuck Bone. They must have felt something and they left and went to Steve Stout's house hmm. in the hills because Steve Stout was giving a party that day too. Okay, so half the entourage leaves. Half is still there. You go and grab all the SUVs and have them pull out in front so when Big and Puff and all them come out, they could just jump in their cars. And we could leave. Okay. So tell me about the scene outside as you're waiting for everyone to get in their cars and start to to take off. So first we lined up parallel to the door in which they have to come out. Right? You follow me? All right, we lined up parallel to where the doors they have to come out. So if they come out right here, the car's right there. They're right there. So then Big is taking his time because you know his uh, fibular bones and his thighs are broken or whatever like that. You know, they fractured or whatever. So it's taking them a long time to come out. So they get out, Big gets in the car, everybody get loaded up. I said, come on, let's go. We ready to go. Puff is running back and forth like... Yo, he'll see a girl, he'll go grab a girl. He said, yo, Gene, remember her? She coming to the party tomorrow. I'm like, you remember her? What the fuck is you talking about, bro? I never seen him act like this ever because he don't act like that. Because even in New York City, once Puff get in the car, he'll leave his mama. We gone, we out. So Puff is like looking. And if you see the cameras, you see him running back and forth, looking and everything like that. So I said, big man, what we standing around here for? He said, that's your man. That's your man. And I said, yeah. All right. So then I said, Puff, what's going on? He said, yo, Paul them ain't got their car yet. I said, this guy is a cop out here. And they can't get his car out the garage thing. I got all these cars. I got these cars out of it. What are you talking about? You understand? So now we pull out the driveway. When we pull out onto the driveway, now, this, this is the driveway. We pull onto the driveway, and I don't know the street. This, is it Wishaw or Fairfax? Which street is like there on the side of that? Is it Not sure. Wishaw or Fairfax? Well, whatever street is right there, when you come out the uh, driveway, you got to make a right turn. So we, come, we, we parked up in the driveway. So it's Puff, it's Big's car. And I still think we're waiting for Paul and them car. So now... They get, uh, uh, people are coming by. Now, I seen y'all seen a lot of videos. And in those videos, it seemed like it was a lot of people right there, you know, when Big got shot and everything like that. That's not, that's on the other side of the, v- the venue. 
where all those people was walking back and forth like that. Because on our side of the street, it was nobody over there. You understand? So this guy in this blue and white shirt comes walking down. So he walks down and he just goes through the garage, you know what I'm saying, while the cars is lined up. I have my gun under my shirt. I have my gun under my shirt, you know, with, with my hand, you know, sideways to the trigger like this. You know what I'm saying? You know, you don't put it on the trigger or nothing like this. I got my gun on something like that. So the guy walks through and now I, I see Paul. I say, yo, Paul, what's up? He said, yeah. And the guy just kept on walking. I, I said, Paul, you see the guy in the blue and white shirt? He said, yeah, I saw him. He said, yo, he puff, puff all right. I said, yo, puff straight. You know what I'm saying? Just keep your eye on him. So the guy had walked away. You know what I'm saying? So then next thing you know, less than five minutes from that, here this guy come down. He dressed in a blue suit, white shirt, blue bow tie. You understand? He comes and he just, I'm, it's, a, it's a pillow right here. Puff is in the driveway. If you walking down the street, you can't see me. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm standing right by the pillow, right? So you can't see me. So when he got to the point, because he was walking closer to the curve than he was in the middle of the sidewalk, he was walking closer to the curve, close to the cars, I see him. And Puff is about, I would say 10 to 15 yards from him, right? And I'm about five yards from from him. So the guy, when I come from over the pillow, he stops immediately. And he just looked at me and I looked at him. He didn't say nothing. So I lowered my arm and he could see my gun. He looks me in my eye and turns right back and walks down the street. So when he got far enough from down the street, maybe four or five car lengths and everything like that. I say, yo, y'all ready? He said, yeah, we ready. So we pulls out the driveway and now we lined up side the street. There's cars parked there from the opening of the museum all the way down to the corner. So we parked right there coming out the garage and I see Paul and them. Big's man is across the street. He has a white um, land cruiser. He's from Philly. I think Charlie Baltimore may have been in the car with them. I'm not for sure. So when we pull out the driveway, Paul comes up to me. I say, yo, Paul, you good? You good? Y'all ready to go? You ready to go? I say, all right, because we had already made, Puff had already made the decision that we we're going to Steve Stout's house now. So when he gets up there and he said, yo, we were just leaving. Like, no, we were going to Steve Stout's house. I had got a call from Chaz. I had called Chaz and I let Chaz know. I said, yo, Chaz, um, we about to go to Steve Stout's now. I said, no, I'm coming down there. Man. Y'all don't go to Steve Stout's house. Y'all don't go to Steve Stout's house. And he didn't say anything on the phone. You know, he, said, he said, I'm on my way down there. You know what I'm saying? So. He was he had left Steve Stouts in them house. So we parked on the side of the Peterson Museum. So when I said to Paul, Paul said we was ready to go, I say, all right, follow us. I tried to ride on the side of the car. Puff said, Yo, Gene, what you doing? I said, I'm riding on the side of the car. I'm gonna have my gun out. I'm on the side of the car. At the time, I'm 265, you know what I'm saying? I'm not the street 30, you know what I mean? So I was a little, a little slimmer back then. So he says to me, um, Gene, if you don't get in this car, you ain't going to never work for bad boy ever again. I said, man, how the fuck are you going to try to tell me how to do my job? He said, Gene, we don't need that look. We don't need that look. Get in the car. As I go to get in the car, this motherfucker reached down and let his seat all the way back. 
So now I got to put my leg sideways. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is you doing? And so then Kenny uh, said, you ready? He said, you ready? I said, Kenny, run the next three lights. Run the next three lights, Kenny. Kenny said, for what? I said, motherfucker, run the next three lights, Kenny, or I'm going to drive. Run the next three lights. Kenny just took off. When he took off, we got past the light because it was a flashing red light. We got past the light and um, we got across the street. Tone, who was behind me, said, yo, somebody in the car pointing a gun at Big Nim. I goes to open the door. I goes to open the door. Fucking next thing you know, you hear it say, pow. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah. Was five or six cars were like, pop, 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 pop. Right? Fucking Kenny guns the car going forward. I said, Kenny, what the fuck is you doing? He said, they shooting at Big. He said, we don't know who they shooting at. He then goes up the block, stops, and do this three-point, something like that, U-turn, comes back. And as we coming back, we see the guy turning the corner from the corner. He was parked on the corner because there's no way he could have got on the side unless his car was already parked there. You understand what I'm saying? So now, yeah. we stops right in the middle, right in front of Big's car. We stops. Puff jumps out the front seat and runs around there to Big's car. All that shit running around the block. I ran down the block and shit like that. That's bullshit. When we got in front of the car, he jumps out the car, ran over to the big side of the car. So now I'm behind Puff and I'm looking down the block and everything like that. Uh, those girls who was right there on the corner talking to Puff and them, they had, I'm uh, talking to uh, Big and Lil C's and them. I don't see them. The, the street is clear. Um, Tone said, Gene, come on, let's go. Me and Tone hops back in the car. And we try to take after the guy. Tone is trying to floor it, but it had one of those government chips in there, the car. So every time we get close to 100, go, go all the way back down. So we can see the guy at the top of the hill. Oh, it was a top. We see the guy up at the top where he had to make what he made a right. When he made that right turn, when we got up the top of the hill, we ain't see shit. So I said, Tone, let's go back, man, to make sure everybody all right. Because I'm the only one got a gun. I got two of mine and I gave Paul one of mine. So we get back. And as um, soon as I get out the car, I go down to the Peterson Museum. And I just, that little, uh, that little corner where I said that I was at before the Muslim came out right there, I just chilled right there like it was nothing. While they was all at the top. You know what I'm saying? Now they got Emmerland's fire department and the police department on the other side of the museum. Wasn't thinking. Should have ran over there and got the ambulance guys to get it. Wasn't thinking, man, at all. So that's when I see DJ Quick come up the block. He was coming from up the block. And he said on his phone, he said, uh, yo, I think they got one of those bad boy niggas. They said they was going to get him. I said, they said they was going to do what? And then Paul come running down the street. Yo, Gene, we about to go. We got to go. What are you doing down here? So I looked at Quick. Quick looked at me. I went away. I, I went, um, ran up ran up the street with them, got in the car. Puff got in the car with Big. He was sitting behind Big, right? D-Rock had came back because they all had ran down the block when, once Big got shot. All that shit, Lil C said, we was behind the truck. He was a lie because... You, you guys come running down the block because D-Rock was like, yo, they got, damn, they shot my man. They got my man. And Puff got in behind 
uh, big. And I said to Puff, whatever y'all do, don't let them go to sleep. Don't let them go to sleep. Whatever y'all do, don't let them go to sleep. And Kenny jumped in their car because he said he knew where the hospital was at. And now Tone was driving our car. So Puff said, can you know where the hospital is? He said, yeah, I know where the hospital is. And Big and he said, yo, Big, I'm going to get you to the hospital. Big, I'm going to get you to the hospital. And Big said, just do it before I close the door. He said, just do it. Lucy said he didn't say nothing. But I see he's a 17-year-old kid. He in shock and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? When those shots went off, I heard somebody was on your program say, everybody ducked down in the car. Only one person ducked, and that was Puff. Everybody else was trying to look back or was looking back at the situation. Kenny was driving for, we all was trying to look back. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, the car was shot four times with the fourth shot being being fatal. Uh, by the time Big got to the hospital, he was pronounced dead. Uh, he was I know he was dead. Years, yeah, he was 24 years old. I knew he was dead. Yeah, he was only 24 years old. Uh, still still a young kid, honestly. Right. Uh, literally half my age right now. Um, you know, when you guys were outside, did you see Keefe D, any of the Southside guys in front of the museum before Keefe you guys D. took off? I seen Keefe D when he came upstairs because I was wanting to introduce him to Big. Oh, okay. I was like, yo, Big, you know him? Big was like, nah. I said, Big, you don't know him? This is one of the... Uh, 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 what we used to call him back in the day? Head, uh, it's, it's the terminology we used to give the guys who were bosses. You know, back then, I said, yo, yo, this one of the bosses from out there, Keefe D, one of them Crips. He was like, oh yeah, all right. They gave each other dap and that was it. That was it. Okay. So the the Muslim guy that you saw that night, before before the incident actually happened, you know, later on there was police sketches. Uh, they were saying that the guy's name was Amir Muhammad. Does the police sketch look like the person that you saw? No, no. It, it's similar. Like I said, the bone structure. I had told them that. I said the bone structure was a little higher. You know what I'm saying, Vlad? You know, um, this is what I do for a living. You know, I'm a New York State parole officer. We had to go to school. We had to take classes. We had to take things with the DEA, with the Secret Service. We had to take classes with uh, NYPD, you know, state corrections and all that stuff like that. So uh, when I told them, I said, yo, the bone structure was a little different. You understand? Uh, he had everything right. The blue suit, the white shirt, the blue bow tie, the whole nine yards. And how we found that out was is that Little C's at the hospital. He said, a Muslim shot big. And I said to Paul, with the blue suit, white shirt, blue bow tie, he said, Gene, how you know? I said, that motherfucker walked up the puff car first. But let's go a little further than that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm, this is your interview. I'm going to let you ask the question. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go further. No, no, but... Everybody's trying to say, you got to take the witness of what they said that night, that week, or whatever. Whenever they took, they gave their first statement, listen to what they said. You understand? Now, the guy walked up to me in Puff car. There's a picture that the LAPD, when they came to, sh to, to, to interview me with my lawyer, Eloise Nurse there, and they made a mistake and showed me that picture. How they make a mistake? They were taping me without my consent, without my permission. New York is not a two-party state. You have to have an individual's permission to tape them. They were taping me and the tape clicked off. When they clicked up, when the tape clicked off, they had pictures under the sheets, under the cover, right, with the tape recorder. So they had to move the blanket now the sheet now to get to the tape recorder, right? Then my lawyer said, you're taping my client without his permission? 
They give this excuse. Oh, we can't remember everything. So we, she said, no, we're not doing it. He's here to help y'all. And y'all sitting there, here, uh, uh, you know, infringing on his rights, breaking his rights, whatever terminology, legal terminology used at the time. Um, and then they had a bunch of pictures on the wall. I said, what are these pictures here? And I grabbed the picture. And the picture was the Muslim guy, me, and Puff in there. And it didn't come from no, no videotape from somebody because they had the Muslim guy face facing me, had Puff on the side and, and, and the side of me. So it came from some kind of camera from the Peterson Museum. But they had the face of the Muslim guy messed up where I couldn't see it. You know what I'm saying? I'm clear, Puff clear, his suit and all we had on was clear, but his face wasn't. And then they're giving me the shit that they gonna uh, have the computer regenerate some kind of uh, photo and stuff like that and show it to me at a later time that they were gonna come and show it to me in two weeks or have fly me out to LA. I never heard back from him ever. And to the deposition. Well, uh, Amir Muhammad, who they say is the the Muslim guy in that in that photo, is a I believe a, a mortgage broker somewhere in California. Claims that he has absolutely nothing to do with this. Does not want to do interviews. Uh, basically, is trying to separate himself away as far as possible. Um, you know, sees said what 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 he what he said. But ultimately, there's there's other stories that that have surfaced on this. There was a guy named Pucci who was one of Suge's guys Bruh. who they say what was paid to kill what was paid to kill Biggie. Go Bruh. ahead. What did the witness that night say? Who was there? The eyewitness that saw his mentor, the eyewitness that saw his big brother. What did the eyewitness say that night? He said that. A Muslim shot big. I placed the Muslim at the scene. I don't give a shit what nobody say 10 years later, 15 years later. What? Because they rappers, they black, that I, what we saw, what we experienced don't count. You want to make up something? Everybody ducked down in the car. Nobody ducked down in the car. Who ducks down when they hear a shooting? No, nobody. They, we looking to see where the shot's coming from first. That's what we do. We want to know where they coming from. End up ducking into something. So my whole thing about it is they not taking what the eyewitnesses has said into accountability. Why would why what would we say don't have no 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 um no leverage? What we say don't mean a damn thing. Come on, brother. We were there. If I placed the guy there and Lucy said that's who shot big, then why don't y'all show that picture of me puff and the Muslim guy? When you finally got to the hospital and you found out the big had died, how'd you feel? I knew he was dead. So you already knew? I already knew when, when we pulled him out the car, and I know people going, you know, cause you know how the internet is. Yo, you didn't have to say that. When he had soiled himself, let me just put that way. And I grabbed him and you had the stint. I dropped his leg, man. It's like all my, Strength had left my body. You know what I'm saying? And then I hear somebody say, Gene, what you doing? And I just grabbed him. And we put him up on that damn stretcher. That's a lot of dead weight, bro. But I was like, Paul said, Paul came to me and said, yo, Gene, what's wrong? I said, that nigga dead, Paul. He said, no, nah, dog, he just was hit. It's trauma. I said, nigga, he pissed and shit on himself. He dead. And so then I walk in the hospital. Puff coming running out the back door and he grabbed my arms. He grabbed both of my arms because they was giving the people in the hospital a lot of problems because now fans and people in there who the entourage like that. I was like, yo, y'all get the fuck out this hospital right now. Now I'm in my beast mode. You know what I'm saying? 
ain't nobody, you know, I hate to be like that because it's hard to come back from that. And that always got me in a lot of trouble. But Puff grabbed me both about both of my arms. He said, Gene, we got to pray. We got to pray. And I pushed that nigga hands off me and I said, pray for what? That nigga's dead. Call Chaz. Chaz said he on his way. Chaz bring the whole crew to the hospital. I was it? I was, man, I was like, it, it F with me for, and it's still F with me when I hear his music. It's still F with me because you was around and you was a part of hip hop greatness. And to see that kid go out like that, when he has so much love, man, yo, when Big was showing me his contract and talking to me about his artists and everything like that, and we was laughing and joking, it was like, it was like, it was like spiritual. You know what I'm saying? It was on a whole nother level. You know, I see this kid right here. He was on a whole nother level. He knew he was going to be, that God had afforded him the opportunity to be greater than anybody ever thought he was going to be. Yeah, I mean, qu quite a loss. I mean, to this day, still, yeah. still considered one of the greats. You can't have an all-time great rapper conversation without throwing Biggie in that conversation. It's just not Bro, he wrote, he, wrote, he wrote six albums. Yeah. People don't know that he wrote six. He don't get credit for the six albums, but he wrote six albums. Yeah, he was writing for Kim, for C's, for Puffy. Junior yeah. Mafia. No, was, you know what I'm saying? He yep, did his, his three albums yeah. and everything. He wrote the whole Junior Mafia album. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He did 75% of Kim's album. Mm -hmm. You understand? But he couldn't take claim for none of the stuff he was doing because somebody owns his publishing. Right. Puff owns his publishing. If he take claim to that, that money goes to Puff. Not him, yeah. or the people that he put in place. Uh, well, after the incident, law enforcement showed up at your job, and like you said, you know, you were law enforcement yourself, so you you start to cooperate, you know, as a as a any other citizen would. And from what I understand, when Puff caught caught wind that you're actually working with the investigation, he stopped working with you and stopped contracting you. No, Puff had uh, already uh, said when I called the office to get my money, but it wasn't for the bigs thing. It was for two jobs that I did with him for Arista because Arista was looking for my social security number. So uh, Puff said to him, Puff said, uh, told uh, Kirk Burroughs that uh, he didn't want to use me no more and everything like that. I was cool with him. <laughs> it really, you know, listen to me. They had been trying to get me to quit my state job and retire out because after you get uh, tenured in, you can retire out with your weapon and go like, man, I'm not doing none of the above. You know, I got a dental plan. I got a health plan. I got eyeglasses and, you know, and I'm getting at the time it was 75 to 100 and some thousand dollars a year working my job and still running a elite security company and still doing parties. And I, you know, I was that dude. If you look at that, um, you know, everybody think that I was so-called just a security person now, you know what I'm saying? And there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with working law enforcement. But uh, Puff, if you listen to that SNS volume four at the 20 minute mark, the 2015 minute mark, Puff is calling out all the crews in Manhattan and New York. And he called out all the guys that he felt that was big back then. And he called up, yo, Slick, what up, Big Gene? You know what I'm saying? So he was calling out the dudes who was about it, about it in New York at that time that he knew of. So when you get to this internet, this, this, this 10, 20 years ago and stuff like that, people want to try to put like, yo, this cat was just some jealous security guy, stuff like that. No, bro, I worked hard. I worked hard to put, in, put myself in a position you know what I'm saying? To be that dude out here that I was linking the streets 
with the record industry because a lot of guys in the record business were scared of the streets. I introduced Chaz to the record business and to the people like that. You understand what I'm saying? They was terrified of him. Cause you know, you know his background, you know his, his right. one of the nicest men in the world. But he was a terror back in the day. And they <laughs> right. knew of that. Yeah. You said that Biggie had showed you a contract that he was gonna sign with another label after this next album? Yeah, Big had a contract. Uh and what happened was when me and Puff rode on the plane coming back down there, uh, Puff gave me his his briefcase. And everything like that, like, yo, here, like, me carry this shit. I say, all right, motherfucker, I got five hours, six hours on this thing. Let me see what's in the briefcase. And I seen big contract. And it was talking about, well, you get 250000 you know, uh, for signing. You're going to get another 250000 The thing go gold. Then you're going to get this much, and you're going to get that much. And then at the end of the contract, I was skimming through it. At the end of the contract, said, oh, we're going to discuss about you getting your publishing and your marketing back. Right. So I was asking Big's questions about that because I not I didn't know what publishing was. I didn't know what marketing was. And Big was showing me a contract because I was saying to Big, he Big was like, yo, Gene, I like you. I would take you with me, bro. But you love that nigga too much. I said, love that nigga too much. What the fuck you mean? You, I love a nigga too much. He said, yeah, you love him too much, bro. I would take you with me. I said, nigga, how you going to take me with you and you broke? He said, I'm broke. I said, yeah, nigga, you broke, man. You owe Mike Gadget 30000 for the system and them drop boxes he put in your, in your truck. And he was like, yo, how you know that? I said, niggas talking, run their mouth big. Yo, he said, oh, shit. He said, but I'm about to get this money. So he showed me, I said, you about to get that money? He said, yeah, look at this. It had Charlie Baltimore, Cameron, Little C's, Little Kim, uh, Junior Mafia, Tracy, I don't know, Tracy Murray, Tracy, <laughs> Tr Tracy Lee, Tracy Lee, Tracy Lee, yeah. and the commission. And they, I think the contract was for so many years for like 62 million, it comes out to like $62 million. Damn. I, I was like, that's what I said. I'm like, damn. <laughs> I said, yo, big. You know what I'm saying? You go, he say, he say, big, because he was smoking those, those, those soft pack Newports. I say, big, you want a Newport? Because I wouldn't give him a Newport at first, because I had the box Newports. You know what I'm saying? I said, big, you want a Newport? He was like, yo, Gene, my man. You know what I'm saying? He said, yo, oh, now you want me to, now you want to give me a cigarette now. I said, nigga, you're going to be the man with that. He said, yeah, man. He said, but listen, I'm going to get rid of the whole Junior Mafia. They're going to have to start writing. They're going to, the people who are going to be there are going to have to know it's a business now. You know, they're going to have to start writing and holding their own. He yeah. said, I said, what's up with Lil' Kim then? He said, yo, he said, that's my bitch. She good. She don't mind working. I said, all right. So then his mother had called. <laughs> and she was fussing with him on the phone. I could hear her because she owed, he owed the contractor $60,000 for a house that she was building in Philly. So then when he got out the phone, I said, motherfucker, I told you you was broke. Because he was telling his mom, mom, don't worry about it. Give me the number. Just give me his number. He ain't going to stop building nothing. He ain't going to stop building nothing. I'm going to handle it. I'm going to take care of it. You understand? I was like, yeah. I said, I told when he got out the phone, I said, nigga, motherfucker, I told you you was broke. You know what I'm saying? And then we was just talking. I said, yo, Big, can I get in the video tonight? He said, yeah, you can get in the video. And so then uh, I had got a, a phone call. I had to, um, I don't know if I had to be in court or I had to testify or something like that, but I had to go back to the city for a couple of days. And um, I got on the jet out that night, the red out that night and came back to New York. Then I came back out that Wednesday. Well, we're now nearing 25 years since this murder, and it's still unsolved. I don't think Why it's do unsolved. Think that is? I don't think. Well, because, I mean, officially, officially, according me. to law enforcement, it is unsolved. Right, according to law enforcement, unsolved. But if you got all the information and you are stopping the public, you are stopping FBI agents, and you're stopping people who can solve the case. You understand? and bring it forefront to the world, then it had to be a reason why. Everybody know that 
if they find that the LAPD, because, bro, you and I both know you've been to Beverly Hills, right? Mm -hmm. What gang member is doing a murder, uh, 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 murder in Beverly Hills and making it back to Compton or making it back to Wa or Watts or making it back anywhere? Ain't nobody doing no murder in Beverly Hills and making it back nowhere. Helicopters, everything is out. Everything is showing. You know, they they put helicopters off for somebody jaywalking. How the hell are they not going to put helicopters off when somebody has been shot? And then there was a shooting in the air prior to being getting shot that brought the police and the fire department on the other side of the museum anyway. So why wasn't the helicopters and things out then? You understand what I'm saying? So... My whole thing about it is, is that it had to be some people that had some influence to get that murder done and get away with it. It had to be people because you and I know who was at the vibe party that night, black, black. white people, black people, <laughs> black people, <laughs> black people, <laughs> you know, black people, they got cars up in there that cost hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in that museum. What the first thing they're going to make sure there's working? They security cameras inside and outside. Right? Mm -hmm. What they're going to make sure that they have enough security, enough police, enough presence that nothing don't go wrong. It's no way that you going to tell me there was a bank across the street that they didn't get the, the LAPD or uh, didn't get the footage from the nearby places when it was told to them that car was parked on that corner all night. You understand? They have the evidence to make this case. They just not giving it up. And that's real talk. They don't want to because if they find they own has something to do with it. It was going to cost the city four to six hundred million dollars. Easy, easy, easy because of Big E's future earning potential. Correct. Which was which was massive. Right. His clothing line, you know, so his marketing, yeah. his clothing line, his is not only just a music thing, just him as a person. You know, he had uh, Big E shoes, sneakers and all his other shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad, man. And then in 2003, Wolf gets killed yeah. during uh, a situation with BMF, right? Uh, which he ended up shooting first, uh, and they and they returned fire, ended up killing him. I was actually with Big. I actually ended up being flown out by BMF like right around that time, and I was at Big Beach's house while right. he saw the the ankle monitor. Uh, and, and from what I understand, which was kind of crazy, was, uh, you know. The standoff happened, Big Meech and those guys in self-defense ended up killing Wolf. Uh, and then once Big Meech gets off house arrest, Puffy throws him a big party. Bruh, you know, I don't know where you get that part of it from, man, but we were all cool. You understand? Uh, Terry was more friends with Wolf, but Meech party more with Wolf because Terry didn't really do all that partying and stuff like that. So I even spoke to Meech about this in Cancun. Um, this was about some gangster shit, you know, some, some like this girl knocks Wolf hats off in the, in, in the club. She was actually pregnant by Wolf. You understand? Or uh, pregnant and Wolf thought it was his and he was trying to get her to get rid of it or whatever like that. But she was with this other dude and she three, four months pregnant by Wolf. So she's with this other kid fronting with this kid when she actually really wanted Wolf. She comes, knocks his hat off, he grabs up. So Meech says something to him, but when do you start talking to Wolf? You know, like that, you understand? Or whatever the circumstance situation was. But see, what people don't know was, Puff was putting a battery in Wolf back, talking about, I don't need you no more. When I get this, do this uh, universal deal, I'm going to give you $300,000 and leave you the fuck alone. He said, Wolf said, you could never leave me alone. You understand? He said, but them guys ain't tough like you think they are. So he putting a battery in this kid's back. You know, I'm listening to all this shit right there. 
But Wolf don't care. He said, yo, them niggas ain't like that. I'm telling you. He ain't like that. You understand? Paul was talking about, I don't need you no more. I don't need you no more. You understand? I'm good. So whatever happened to them in Atlanta happened to them in Atlanta. Wolf decide to, when they come outside, he shoots uh, 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 at Meech and them, which caught Meech in his buttocks. If you caught, get caught in the buttocks, you're going in the opposite direction. So you didn't, you didn't want it. Meech ain't want to do nothing to him because Meech had enough people and he had enough crew outside that he could handle that stuff. But the dude who got close to Wolf was the dude who killed him that he put down with BMF. He, it was his dude from Brooklyn that he put down because he needed some money. He was a shooter. Yo, Meech, look out for my man. Put him on your payroll. You need somebody to do work for you just like that. Whoop they whoop. He did that. You understand? And that's the dude who shot him in Riz. Yeah. Yeah, man. Just a lot His of- His own man. A, a lot of tragedy. Uh, yeah. A lot of sadness. Right. Um, you know, Gene D, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your story, man. I'm sorry for your loss yeah. uh, with Big, especially, you know, being there and seeing the events unfold and having to deal with you know, what you could have done a little bit differently or had you done this or that and having to basically live in your own head uh, mm -hmm. for all these years because, you know, it's been 24, almost 25 years uh, mm -hmm. since since Biggie's passing and, you know, he's bigger than ever. You know, it's as if he's still here. You still hear his songs on the radio. You still people referencing him. People are still discussing him. Uh, and he really, you know, I mean, although there were other artists on Bad Boy, Really, I feel like he was the 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 root of, of the bad boy tree. And everything that happened after him, I felt was based off his success and based well, on, on what he put in. Somebody somebody would say that, but if you were there from the store, you know uh the root has to start with a seed, and the seed was Craig Mack. You understand? True. And True. uh Craig Mack started the success and because they pattern they self after some of Pock shit, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. uh, they became famous from it. You know what I'm saying? That that whole that uh, that Pock formula. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So my whole thing about it is, is that man. I think my show, Cooking and Conversation, has helped me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, meet people out here, talk with people. You know, I met a lot of great people that has helped me. Why I don't have to sit on nobody's couch? And, you know, tell them my stories and shit like that, that I could get on here and discuss things. Um, I would hope to come back and maybe I'll tell you that uh, 50 Cent and that Ja Rule beef on the next one. <laughs> on the next one, man. On the next one. Right. Gene Deal, man. I appreciate you coming in. Yes, sir. Until next time. All right. Peace. Peace, bro.